none of us can help but think about our world today and situation that we find ourselves in and you even dread making the statement, can it get any worse? Um, I think we can answer that question pretty quickly. Yes, it can, right? And um, we see that around us all the time. As I was, just, I was, I was thinking as I was going through the, the hallways up there at Bucyrus Hospital, man, I haven't been up there for, I don't know how long. It just seemed, it just seemed strange, you know. The, uh, it wasn't many folks. There were a few folks there in the hospital, and, and but I hadn't been been to the hospital. I mean. I think it has to be the longest in my whole lifetime I've not been to a hospital, it seems like. But, uh, and uh, when I was there, it just, uh, it just seemed kind of eerie, I guess is the word, because there's a few people there, but not many. And uh, I was thinking about <clears throat> this section in uh, Revelation of how the one phrase I trust you noticed <clears throat> that was repeated a number of times was in one hour. You see that? Uh, it, it happened at least five or six times that that one phrase was repeated, that all this happened in one hour. And um, there's another, a couple other phrases here, the idea in verse 21 about, you know, he throws a millstone into the, into the, uh, in, into the water, it casts into the sea. And, then, you know, that's a, that's a quick action, isn't it? It just happens rather, rather briefly, rather quickly. And, and as I was looking at this passage and thinking about this, um, and again, I mentioned tonight, you know, any comments I have about what our situation really come out of this chapter because this is a time it seems to me like it happened so quickly. You know, God is going to bring his judgment quickly. Uh, none of us, if you look in hindsight, you know, can even think about how our lives have changed over the fast pa fa past little while. Look what I've got. See? I carry it around with me. I had to wear it today. And, I, you know, I said to myself, I do think I had a medical condition at the hospital. I couldn't see. My glasses all fogged up. I was a risk going up the hallway there. Uh, but, you know, that was just me. <clears throat> um, I had to take them off. And then I'm really a risk when that happens. Um, but, you know, it, it's changed, hasn't it? And, and it's, it's, it's happened so quickly. And I'm not saying, well, I think a lot of these things are not good. But what's, what, is, what has impressed me about all of this is just how, how quickly things happen. I think that's what's impressed all of us, <clears throat> is how things can change so rapidly. Uh, things that we think are nailed down so tightly <clears throat> you know, are, are, are things that are never going to change. Our Constitution. You know, think about the, the founding of our, of our Constitution and what it was all about. <clears throat> and now we're seeing, you know, this whole situation on its end. Uh, it changes rather rapidly. I remember <clears throat> a few years ago, uh, I was talking to my Uncle John. He's in Columbus. He was a lawyer. And we were talking about some legal thing. It was when he was making our will up and so on and so forth. And I said, you know, it, this could really change quickly, couldn't he? He says, Tim, he says, you don't have any idea how fast things can change. Just one judge making a decision changes everything. And boy, that has really been borne out, hasn't it? Uh, one judge makes a decision in our lives that we have lived in such a way as this happened very, very rapidly. And, and it's, it's a scary thought in one, in one way, but it also, maybe not so much scary, a scary thought as it is, and I, I, have, I have viewed this throughout this entire time, that this should drive us to the Scripture. And I really think that's what's happened <clears throat> for us, I would trust as a church and as a, a people, is that the scriptures are really that which does not change. I, I have been so impressed. You've heard me say it a couple times. I've been so impressed with the difference and, and, the, and the dichotomy, the difference between uh, our world and our scriptures. Now, we love to change our scriptures. Now, we don't. Okay? I'm speaking editorially here. We love to change scripture, <clears throat> and we are watching that all the time. I'm sorry, our culture loves to change scripture. I mean, just think of some of the changes that have happened in people's lives last 10 years. I mean, if I would have told my grandparents before they passed, I'd have told my dad before he passed away that we would have legalized same-sex marriage 
they would have laughed me out of the room, right? I'm talking five or six years ago. If I would have told them <clears throat> that there's coming a time <clears throat> whenever you're not sure whether you're a male or a female, I mean, I should have used this yesterday. There's these red T's up there. I almost had a feminine moment. <laughs> right, Harold? You know? <clears throat> I think Rachel made that comment. She goes, you know, like, if you feel like a woman, you can just go up there and use that tea. I thought, yeah, who's going to stop me? You know, I mean, if you did, somebody would shoot you this day and age, right? I mean, who? Now, I'm talking about golf, folks. I mean, I better let me explain that if you don't. And there's red teas are for the women, and then there's gold teas for old men like me and some other folks in this church. And then there's some white tees where we had to play off yesterday, and then there's these pro tees that are blue. And so women get this great advantage. I'm sorry, Kathy, I'm just going to say it. They get this great advantage in that they get to go a little higher. And so <clears throat> I thought to myself, <clears throat> you know, that's, that's kind of a fact. I mean, who's going to tell you that you can't use those anymore? I mean, all these things are just phenomenal in our world today. That I, as a pastor, I could not get in to see my mother when she had her hip broken. That, that's just, that just still blows me away. And you've had the same thing in your life if you're not too long ago. I mean, all these things that seem to be so much of a basic issue for us, they're pulled away from us. And when I read a passage such as <clears throat> chapter 18 of, of Revelation, I see a system, don't you? The, de the great debate here is whether this is a localized city, Babylon, or whether it is a system. And I have to say that <clears throat> as life has progressed for me, I'm more and more leaning towards this being a system, you know, like, like Wall Street. Well, I know that's a literal place, but when I say Wall Street or Madison Avenue, you instantly think of a system, wide world of sports. You know that one. It wasn't a planet where athletes inhabited. It was a television program back in the 70s. You know, they had different sports programs. <coughs> it was talking about a, <coughs> excuse me, it was talking about a, a system of things or a culture of, of issues. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about Babylon. If you want to talk about Babylon, Babylon is the city that is mentioned second most after Jerusalem. <coughs> Jerusalem by far is the greatest I mean, everything goes up to Jerusalem. We've looked at this before. When you read Scripture, it's always pointing towards the, the city of Jerusalem. <clears throat> but Babylon is the second most mentioned city in Scripture. And we find that it's mentioned many times. It goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel. That's where it originated. <clears throat> That's a system against God and all that he stands for. And it was a great city in its past, probably a of all the, you study any kind of history, of all the empires, you know, there were four great empires, Babylon, hope I get them right, Babylon, Persia, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. <clears throat> Babylon, remember the dream of Daniel in Daniel chapter 3 or 4? What was the head like? It was of gold. Everything else starts to become a little less. One, I think the breastplate was silver and then uh, bronze and then clay. And, and that was not done by accident because really Babylon was the premier empire. The rest were, were movements out of Babylon. It really was the one that probably set the standard for all the rest. And when Nebuchadnezzar struts around uh, when the gardens, the hanging garden says, look at this great Babylon I have created, he was not speaking in vain because he was probably the lead king at that time as well. <clears throat> so Babylon has always been this <clears throat> situation or this idea that's anti-God, against God <clears throat> in Scripture. And we find that it's a great city, and it's, there's coming a day whenever people are going to wonder after her again, Babylon. And she's going to meet her doom at the hand of Almighty God. First two verses talk about this. And again, probably symbolic Babylon. You know, maybe they rebuild the city. Well, they've got a lot of rebuilding to do if all these things are going to happen to them. So uh, probably more of a symbolic Babylon that's going on. And it's something that really speaks about this world that is opposed to God and all that he stands for. And we find that 
Back in chapter 17, verse 5, it spoke about mystery Babylon. Remember that phrase? And uh, we find that it, there's a link with Babylon to religion. Saw that last Sunday, or last Sunday night, no, two Sunday nights ago because of Bible school. There is a link between religious Babylon and now political Babylon or economic Babylon we're going to see tonight. <clears throat> they, one is setting on the other, remember, until uh, economic Babylon decides that's enough and devours the religious system that is also a part of what's going on. But that religious system helps get things around for this one world government that's going on. And the beast is going to have a headquarters someplace. It could be Rome. It could be symbolic Babylon. That might be where it's at. Maybe they're going to rebuild, rebuild. You know, all these things are not really significant for us. The important part is that it's going to happen. But let me just give you <clears throat> the outline again of the next few chapters. 17, we saw political, I'm sorry, religious Babylon fall. Chapter 18, we're going to see political and economic Babylon fall. Chapter 19, we're going to see Satan fall. And God is going to deal with him. Chapter 20, Millennial Kingdom, and how he's going to rule for that thousand-year reign. And then we're going to look at the new heaven and new earth. The book of Life will be open in chapter 20. So we are moving rather rapidly towards the end of, or the summation of what God is talking about in this book. And it really does set a finality to the Word of God. This is tying everything together that God's Word has been saying up to this point. And so <clears throat> this chapter, I want us to think about four things tonight that are true of Babylon. And um, it's a long chapter, but notice these four things with me. First thing I want you to notice is in verses 1 through 6 that it's dominated by demons. Do Babylon is a place where <clears throat> demons are alive and well, and they are constantly working. And it's going to be dominated by these demons. You, we find this in the first few verses, especially verse 2. Uh, and some of the language here is, is uh, very graphic. Is, remember, let me just, one more thing here before we get into this. John, first century, is writing about a present day situation for us. And so he is describing things in his own language. And so that always has to be kept in mind when you think about this whole situation that we are going, uh, looking at. It says this angel comes out in verse 1. He's from heaven, and he has this great power. Angels have been active throughout the book of Revelation, haven't they? They are the messengers of God. And it says, The earth was lightened with His glory. You know, I had to pause and think about that. Isn't it amazing to think about our whole, our whole earth being lightened with His glory? Now, our world is only half lit at any time, right? I don't have to be too smart to figure that one out because... If it's light here, it's dark in China because the sun shines on half of it. But here it says the entire place is lit. So his glory must somehow be a part of this entire universe that's going on around us because he is moving towards the end of this world and what's going to happen. And he cried with a, with a mighty and strong voice. We, we've, looked at, we've found that many times too. These angels are loud. People pay attention to what they have to say. And here is the prediction. <clears throat> Babylon is fallen, is fallen, is become the habitation of devils and a hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. How did the birds get involved in this thing? You know, you sort of, you sort of think about that. <clears throat> As I was reading this, I thought to myself, you know, why does he bring the birds into this? You know, I, th I don't think there's really a whole lot more, that's right, more gruesome scene than driving down the road and seeing that old buzzard picking at that old bone, do you? I mean, that to me is very unclean. Uh, and so I'm just going to think he's talking about that same kind of a situation here. <clears throat> that, you know, this is sort of the height of, of uh, disgusting, uh, putrid ideas. This, in other words, this world has degenerated. Folks, are we not there? I mean, I don't even want to get into all this tonight, and I'm not, and I'm not planning to. But some of the things that, and, and the news, I mean, if I can stomach 15 minutes of it, I, I feel like I've won a victory. Anybody else feel that way? 
I mean, everything is just tearing apart, and, and you see all this stuff and, and going on. And, and about the only thing I watch is the five, and I got to edit one of those guys out. You know, if you ever watch that, you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but, you know, and that sort of is just sort of a, a summary of what's going on. But the point is, it is becoming more and more vile. And demons, devils, foul spirits used twice. Not only devils, it's their habitation. I truly believe a lot of demonic activity is going on today. A lot of demonic activity. And they are also foul spirits. A lot of that's going on. Foul mouth people. Have you ever heard? I mean, even our president is foul mouth. You know, I, I, I like Trump and all that, but I wish he'd clean that mouth up, don't you? I mean, foul mouth seems to be the way to communicate anymore. It doesn't have to be. And especially for us, we don't want to fall into that kind of a trap. We want our speech to always be open and above board, right? It should be a part of what it means to be a sanctified uh, believer in Jesus Christ. But, you know, foulness, and it seems as if you don't even have to go anyplace. You could, the other day I was, I don't know where I was at, and I heard these young people talking, and I mean, they were using language like, and you know, girl, I'm sorry, ladies, but girls, can't girls be foul-mouthed anymore? You've been around some of that, and here the way they talk about things. It's amazing. Boys can too. Don't get me. I'm not being. I'm gonna get myself out of back into political correct territory. You know, men can too, but it just seems like we are living in a foul generation today, and our world is moving in that direction. And all these hateful birds, and again, all these nations have drunk of the wine of fornication. Isn't that graphic? And they have committed fornication with her. They've waxed rich, verse 3. <clears throat> but then we have this voice of separation. It is our responsibility. Now, let's, we're applying this because we're in heaven, but God is going to have some people here towards the end as well who've been saved in this tribulation period. He says, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sin, that ye receive not of her plagues. Boy, I'm glad I'm not going to receive these plagues, aren't you? Have you been doing that as we have been going through Revelation, thinking about how this world is going to have all of this judgment upon it, and here we are. We're going to be where? We're going to be in heaven with our Savior, enjoying the, the delights of, of heavenly living. No more tears. I mean, I can't even imagine what that's like. You know, just... Just a few minutes ago for me, seeing, you know, tears being shed because of the, the, the difficulties of our lives today. And we've all shed tears in this room because of that. And God can wipe all those tears away because of the eternal bliss that's going to be ours in heaven. What a grand thought that is. And here are these people in this world, they're filled with fornication and idolatry something that God is going to judge. Verse 5 to me is a, still talking about these demons. He says, for her sins, got to modify her. I would think he's talking about Babylon, right? Her again was found back in verse 4. For her sins have reached unto heaven, <clears throat> and God hath remembered her iniquities. You got to pause there for a second. You ever think about that? God is observant. This is His world. This is His creation. He is the one who made this world. Without Him, there would be nothing here tonight. And why did He make this world? To glorify Him. That's the purpose. That's why you're here. And this world was made for His glory, right? Read that in Genesis. You find it throughout Scripture. But He says it is filling up. You ever, uh, you ever fill a bucket up and it keeps getting closer and closer towards the top? And, and <clears throat> as you get towards the top, you leave the water on and all of a sudden it just starts. Maybe you don't enjoy that kind of thing. I don't, it's not joy, but you know, it happens to you. And, and, you know, it starts flowing out the top. You know, that, isn't that a graphic picture of our world, abortion? And I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes in verse 13. This 
trafficking today in young ladies and young men. We talked about the other Saturday in our men's time together. This is something that I really wasn't up on like I should be. Folks, this is becoming epidemic. And now we are talking about pedophilia being, and I hope, you know what the term means. I don't have to explain it to you. They're starting to talk about these issues of being legal. and I mean, I can't even think about some of these kind of thoughts. Can you? Our wickedness, abortion, euthanasia, pride, all these things, it's filling up. It just keeps getting higher and higher. And all of a sudden, God's going to say, enough. I've had enough. God does that with Christians sometimes, but here he's talking about this world. And this idea of <clears throat> reaching unto heaven. As God is observing this world, this, this cesspool of wickedness is starting to come. In the Old Testament, we have this idea of this incense rising from the altar, and it's sweet in the nostrils of God. Now, you know, that's a giving, an, it's giving God a human quality. Here we have this wickedness, you know, bubbling. You ever, you ever watch these mad scientists when they're concocting these great potions around and they put in this and they put in that and, and this stuff starts, you know, I'm talking, you, you've watched this kind of stuff. You know, it starts bubbling up and starts moving outward. Well, you know, that's sort of what our sin is doing in this world. It's, it's bubbling and bubbling and bubbling and rising higher and higher and higher. All of a sudden, like the volcano, remember the old science experiments? It sort of explodes, and God says, enough, enough. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her her double according to her works. In the cup which she has filled, fill to her double. It's wicked enough already. God says, I'm going to double it. I'm going to make it times two. <clears throat> she is going to feel the full brunt of my anger and my judgment. I can't even think of what it would be like to double the judgment of God. How could you double hell? You know, hell's hell. But when I read Scripture, I find that there does appear to be degrees in hell. Some who have heard are more responsible. Now, again, it's hell. But when you think of God's judgment being poured out and some of the things that we've read up to this point with the trumpets, the seals and the trumpets and the, and the vows, judgments coming upon this earth, <clears throat> it's really the outline of the book. And now you say, I'm going to double all of this. I mean, it's to the point where it's beyond our ability to comprehend how God is going to bring this great judgment upon this earth. And so <clears throat> this world is dominated by demon, but also, secondly, it is defiant in its depravity. <clears throat> Verse 7 will tell us this. <clears throat> Very defiant. Notice what this Babylon says. Verse 7. How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she said in her heart, I set a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. All this that she's been through, you'd think there'd be some repentance, wouldn't you? No, defiance, defiance. Idolatry, we found that in this section, back in the verses before this, why people are worshiping her. Then also we find great pride, don't we? That's another one of her sins that is found here in this section. You know, she says how, glor how to glorify herself. So she is very much, the word I used to use when I was in school was struck on herself and how great she is. And then she says, I'm going to be, I'm a queen. Even though the beast has been taken care of, she still considers herself to be a queen. And I'm not going to see any sorrow. I'm going to live deliciously. Isn't that a great way to talk about uh, uh, extraordinary pampering of oneself? I'm going to live deliciously. That would be something that most people say, well, I'd like to live deliciously. 
And so, you know, John here uses a very descriptive phrase to talk about how this Babylon is going to conduct herself deliciously. She's going to have the best of everything. It's going to be the best of pleasure. It's going to be the best of luxury. Everything is going to be fine and dandy. It's going to be what many people would say, oh, you know, we are really doing well. <clears throat> things are flowing. And things are going great. Then thirdly, after she's dominated by de demons and defiled with depravity, thirdly, we find she's destined for destruction in verses 8 through 10 because the first word in verse 8 is the word therefore. And here we start the changing the tone of the chapter <clears throat> because God is now stepping into the <coughs> scene. And notice this briefness now becomes the theme, this very rapidly ending time. <clears throat> Verse 8, therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. She shall be utterly burnt with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the kings of the earth who committed this fornication and lived deliciously with her have, shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for fear of her turmoils, Turmoil, turma, turma, torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great Babylon, that great city, for it in one hour thy judgment is come. <clears throat> it's going to happen quickly. And if we are lovers of Babylon, there's going to be destruction. He says a number of times, Her plagues come in one day. The kings sit and watch this happening. Talking about her burning. And it says in one hour, she is going to be judged for this. And, you know, we think to ourselves, boy, you know, that seems to be awful fast. That God would just sort of step in and almost instantly in one hour just destroy this entire system. Folks, just mess up our computers today. And we wouldn't even know how to make change anymore, Right? I mean, and I'm not saying that's what this is. Don't get me wrong. I'm not making predictions. Somebody's going to, you know, the Russians or the Chinese or, or whoever this new thing is, TICO or Trump just banned whatever it was, TOCO. Oh, I can't even say the word. Anyway, but all this stuff going on, and, and you know, it's all going to shut down. I mean, if, if they shut us down, our power grids, we would have people running around they wouldn't even know which way was up. And you know that this is the way it is anymore. <clears throat> and so, you know, one hour is really not beyond the realm of possibilities. And if God does the job, he's going to do it right. You're not going to be able to fix it. I don't care how much bleach bit you try. That was Hillary's stuff. Or anything else. <clears throat> it's going to happen. Because <clears throat> God is going to be the one in one hour. He's going to destroy everything that commercial and political Babylon is all about. That has to be the fastest destruction in history. He created our world in seven days. I believe God could have done it in one day if he wanted to, don't you? He certainly could have. He's going to destroy this world that is against him in one hour. Think how rapidly that is. Think what it's going to be like when God starts to bring his judgment upon Babylon and all of her might. The rest of the chapter really talks about the reaction to this time of destruction. <clears throat> in verses 10 through 24 will be our last point is she's depressing, depressing in, in desolation. And she is depressing in her desolation because as she falls, we see everything that man has lived for, everything that man has put his resources into, every man that, everything that man has sold his soul for is going to disappear with this Babylon because they have put everything, all of their stock, all of their opinions, all of their confidence is found in this Babylon that is about uh, just has been destroyed. <clears throat> Notice some reaction, verse 11. And the merchants of the earth 
shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Boy, it sure sounds like something's going on with the economy, doesn't it? There's no more ability to buy or sell. That's when you need that victory garden out there, right? All those types of areas, but for us, it's, you know, it's not important. If you're not saved, then I think I'd put myself a garden in. Maybe store some of those beans in the basement, you know, all that stuff that needs to happen. <clears throat> then find you a hole and stick them in. I don't know. But here he says, there's no more buying and selling. It all crashes. It's all gone. Isn't that something to think about? Gone in just a few minutes. And he goes, he goes through this list of things. Verses 12 and 13, you have this whole, I mean, long list. All these things are no longer available. And again, the part that gets to me is the slaves and the souls of men. How Babylon has captured the souls of men. She has. It has. I guess I should use the proper pronoun. Babylon truly today has captured the souls of men. We have people who don't even get out of bed or drink their first cup of coffee to the check what the culture's doing for them for the day. They have to find out what their friends are doing for they can do anything because they are so enslaved to the system that has enslaved us to such a great point of view. And I mentioned earlier some of the things that we hear going on, and, and I don't want to get into some conspiracy stuff, but I was, well, I'm just going to, it does seem to appear that, you know, we're having more and more of this, I'm not even sure what you call it anymore, where they kidnap these kids and, and use them for vile. You know, parents, it's a day you need to watch your children like no other, no other time. And, and this isn't, we're not trying to spook anybody here. Right? That's not the point. But it, it's happening. And, and people are enslaving individuals today. Drugs are rampant in our culture. And souls of men, individuals who have been completely and totally immersed in humanistic concepts, where their whole life is just encompassed with themselves and how to get ahead and what they want and how they want it. You know, that's really what Babylon is all about. That's what marketing is all about. If you want to take any kind of a marketing course, you know, what do you do? The first thing you do is you create a need. I mean, that's just the way it is. And our culture today is good at creating a need. We heard about it last week at Bible school, but it's so true. You've got to have these things. And then our souls become more and more enslaved. Have you heard about these experiments where they've taken away people's phones for two weeks? I, I read somebody gave money. I don't know. I, I'm off the top of my head here. I can't document this. But they gave these people some money not to use a phone for two weeks. Some people went nuts. Um, I mean, there a lot of things that I don't agree with that our politicians make laws about, but one of the greatest laws that ever was made, as far as I'm concerned, is you can't use that phone when you drive. I mean, any idiot should they would be to figure that thing out. And yet we are, we are so captured by this stuff. And you know, I really don't care about some of these things, do you? And they just seem to take up so much of our energy and so much of our time. People are becoming enslaved to this. If they don't have this, they almost have to withdraw. Imagine if they would shut down all of these. I don't even know what it is floating around out there someplace. And just all of a sudden, electricity was gone. And towers were gone. 
The information was gone. No communication. It's a scary thought to think about, isn't it? Not if you're depending upon the Lord. Our world is so enamored with this kind of issue. They have to have it. Now, again, am I anti technology No, of course not. I got a phone. I use my phone. I see Titus all the time on my phone. That's my grandson, if you don't know. Uh, so, I mean, it's not the, the stuff is bad. That's not the point. But, you know, we've got to be careful that we don't become so taken that we can't live without. God's Word should be our number one diet, shouldn't it? And that's where we should gain our real strength and sustenance from. I was reading, I just turned in Isaiah chapter 39 today. I was reading, I'm reading through. I never really saw Isaiah like this before, but you know those first 39, 37, 36 chapters, get it right, you talk about judgment. I mean, he goes through Moab and Tyre and Israel. I mean, it's just judgment after judgment upon this world. I mean, he's going to do this and do that. You know, read it for yourself. And then in 36 turns, we start having, here we have Sennacherib coming, and he is dealing with the Rapshika, is dealing with Hezekiah, and he sends out the men, and they're going to take the city, and of course, God intervenes because he brings this great sheet before God, and he lays it down, and he prays about it, and God says, I'm going to deliver you from the Assyrians. 185,000 men wake up dead. Isn't that a great phrase? How do you wake up dead? But you can read it there in Isaiah. You know, it says they wake up and they're dead. Every time I read that, I just think, boy, how graphic God's Word is. And then we move to, you know, he's pouring his heart out because all this judgment has been coming upon the land. And finally, you get to a king who says, God, I have to have you. And he turns the sundial back. I don't know how many degrees, but there's some degrees. He turns the sundial back, and then Assyria is wiped out. The next chapter, you know, he gets sick, and he starts praying. And, of course, that's whenever he has good old Manasseh. He probably should have died in 15 years ahead of time because that was the worst king that Israel had. But then in chapter 40, you turn the page and he starts talking about Christ and how beautiful things are. I thought to myself, you know, the first part is a picture of this world, how God is going to judge. And a picture of Revelation, he's going to bring all these torments upon this world. And yet, when we repent and look to him and ask his forgiveness, he accepts us. And then his blessings start to pour out upon us as individuals. And here we find that's going on in this world today. You know, verse, it's depressing what goes on. These merchants, they made their riches off of her, verse 15. They were getting rich. They had the mark. Things were going well. The rest of the chapter talks about this, how how that, you know, she is finished. The, and verse 20, the, the mighty angel, verse 21, i got to skip over some of this, cast her into the sea. Look at the next couple of verses, verse 22. And notice, the voice of harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpets shall be heard no more at all in thee. Silence. No more craftsmen. Whatever craft sh shall he be, shall be found any more in thee. <clears throat> Sound of a millstone shall be heard no more in thee. The light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by their sorceries were all nations deceived. We are being deceived today as no other time in history. <clears throat> But when God brings his judgment, it's all going to pass away. No more buying, no more selling, no more politics. Praise God for that, right? All of it's going to be over, and he ends with this, and in, and in her was found the blood of prophets 
and of saints and all that were slain upon the earth, God is going to bring his vengeance. Three principles about Babylon that should stir your heart to action tonight. Let me give them to you as we close. Three things that should stir us <clears throat> to be very much involved in what God would have us to be involved with tonight. The first thing is this, come out of her. Verse 4 talks about coming out of Babylon. You and I need to come out of her. The spirit of Babylon is in this world already. We need to not be polluted by that spirit. We hear about separation today, separation of church and state. We should not keep company with Babylon. Come out of her. Verse 4, do not be a partaker of this kind of situation. You and I need to have our hearts stirred to action to see how this holds. And, and I think like today, like no other time in history, we are seeing the futility. We are seeing the, the breaking up. We are seeing how, how, how sinking sand this culture is around us today, how fast it can fall apart. Come out of that. Don't put your confidence in that. Don't allow that to be your source of authority and security. No, come out of her. Realize that God is the one who strengthens us. Don't envy her. Boy, there are many today who wants what the world has. Don't envy a fool. Don't envy what a fool has because there's nothing there for us. It's just simple foolishness. And when it's in light of God's word, it's foolish. Number three, after we are to come out from her and not envy her, verse 20, we can rejoice over her. <clears throat> rejoice over her, and thou heavens, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Never get to the point that you think you're on the losing side. Never get to the point that you think it's all going to fall apart. I read about the church in China. We need to pray for our Chinese brother, brother Christians. They are suffering persecution. They're having their churches torn down. But you know, we should pray for our brother in California. It's not just China anymore, folks. It's getting closer to home. But never think negatively about God. We are on the winning side. One day, Trump's going to say, One day, he's going to split the clouds. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And those that are alive and remain shall join him. So shall we ever be with the Lord. You ever think about that phrase from 1 Thessalonians? So shall we ever be with the Lord. Never again to be separated from him. Isn't it great to be on the winning team? I wished I knew about that, you know, in this world. But one day in heaven, I will be on the winning team because of what God has done for us, how much he loved us, and what he does for us on a daily basis. So Babylon is going to fall. God is going to say, enough. The sin is filling up. And when you hear about Jeffrey Epstein, you hear about all this vile stuff that goes on, and you say to yourself, oh, will not justice be given? Let me tell you one day, justice will be given. Justice will come, and it'll be the greatest justice in all the world. Those who think they've got away with it, those who think there is no ramifications for their activities, God will one day say, your cup is full. And I'm going to come and bring 